Sorry, I had a little confusion there with the technical problems, but here I am. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, so everyone, uh, I'm Sarah Butler with Faith Trust Institute, and uh, we're going to get started here really quickly because Judith can only join us for the first half of the conversation. Um, but a few technical details, um, you should be able to hear me as well as see the technical information slide. Um, and we would like to hear from you. So you can submit your questions or comments at any time using the um, this little box on your screen. If you can't see the box, then click on the orange arrow and that will open up the features and you can send in questions. Um, and thank you to everybody who sent in questions in advance. Um, I am going to introduce Reverend Dr. Marie Fortune. She is the founder and senior analyst at Faith Trust Institute. She's written extensively on the issues of sexual violence and clergy misconduct. Her work is considered foundational in addressing the issues of sexual and domestic violence within both faith communities and secular advocacy organizations. And Marie, you want to introduce everyone else? Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. And welcome to everyone who's joining us tonight. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Sally McNichol. Sally is the co-executive director of CONNECT, a New York City nonprofit organization dedicated to preventing interpersonal violence and promoting gender justice. She has been an anti-violence activist, advocate, and educator for over three decades. And Dr. Judith Herman is joining us, and Judith is a psychiatrist, researcher, teacher and author who is a pioneer in the study of post-traumatic stress disorder and the sexual abuse of women and children. She is the professor of clinical psychiatry at Harvard University Medical School and founder of the Victims of Violence program in the Department of Psychiatry at the Cambridge Health Alliance in Cambridge, Mass. And is a founding member of the Women's Mental Health Collective. So thank you to both of you for joining us tonight for this conversation. We really appreciate uh, your time and, and your expertise. Um, because tonight we have the opportunity to return to a classic in the field of trauma studies. For the Meaningful Voices Book Club, we have read Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herman. This book has undoubtedly shaped the discussion of trauma for clinicians, advocates, and I hope for faith leaders since its publication in 1992. The new edition published in 2015 includes an epilogue uh, from Dr. Herman. Now Judith will be with us tonight for the first part of our discussion and so during that part we want to focus on a few primary issues that she brings to us uh, in her book. So Judith, I want to start out with uh, a few of the, the kind of questions uh, that name some of those primary issues and uh, hear what you have to say. It, it's very clear, I think, that you uh, lay out a moral and ethical context for your discussion in the book from the very get-go. And that it's for me, it's a thread that, that uh, carries throughout. Why was this important to you to do that? To have a moral voice, um, what could be more important, <laughs> seems to me. Um, um, it is I mean, a bit unusual, isn't it, and in, in, uh, in, you know, certainly from a clinical perspective. Well, I had the good fortune to, that, to have my uh, residency in psychiatry um, correspond um, I, I, I be um, happening at the same time that I was in a women's consciousness raising group. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I, I, you know, to discover that um, I, I, I should say that I'd been involved in anti-war and civil rights. Um, at, uh, activism before mm -hmm. I came to the women's movement but mm -hmm. you know when you discover that liberation struggles aren't just about social justice for other people but they're about social justice for you too mm -hmm. um, and then you can see the commonalities in all of them um, then it just seems um, 
apparent that um, the oppression of women is uh, of a, a it has so much in common with other forms of oppression uh, mm-hmm. where one group of, of human beings is subordinated to another by force. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, that's the only way you can subordinate a group of people is using mm-hmm. violence. I mean, obviously, once they're subordinated, you can maintain, you don't need violence all the time mm-hmm. to keep them in a subordinate position. The culture will do a lot and custom mm-hmm. will do a lot. But mm-hmm. ultimately, um, you need violence. It's the same as you do in, in a family. If you're going to keep women subordinated, mm-hmm. you ultimately need to have a show of force. So uh, you, you can see, you can catch my drift here. Um, mm-hmm. And once once I had that enlightenment that um, liberation struggles are all are, are have all of those commonalities, then what else can you do but approach the abuse of children or the abuse of women with the moral voice? Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more, but I'm just not sure that uh, all of our colleagues share that uh, perspective. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> that's <laughs> certainly not. I mean, in, in, in my profession, when I started out, um, you know, I had some good supervisors who basically said, listen to the patient and the patient will tell you mm-hmm. what's what's um I mean, you know, the wise clinicians in medicine say that all the time. Just mm-hmm. listen to the patient. Mm-hmm. The patient will tell you. But, you know, then there are all these other ways of uh that we learn not to listen to the patient and all these other um forces that uh, impinge on us that tell us not to listen to the patient, or the patient is fantasizing, or the, the you know, uh-huh. uh, hysterical women makes these things up, you know, uh-huh. uh, because uh-huh. it's what they really desire, and um, and so you had layers and layers of psychiatric doctrine based on not listening to patients, uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. and the comprehensive textbook of psychiatry estimated the prevalence of all forms of incest at one case per million. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, this was the main text in the field. So, you know, when my colleague Lisa Hirschman and I, I mean, she was just starting out as a psychologist and I as a psychiatrist, and, you know, we we assembled 20 cases Mm -hmm. without any difficulty. Now, either that meant there was something really strange about us which, of course, we entertain that thought, you know, what is it about us that's crazy, you know, or it meant that there was something going on here that nobody was talking about, and, you know, so we began to, you know, we we gathered uh, information, we started to write it up, we published it in the Women's Studies Journal, and, I mean, we started getting letters from all over the country, Oh, I thought I was the only one. I thought nobody would ever believe me. I thought it was all my fault. The usual. And uh, so we we knew that we had we had tapped into you know a, a, a something that a consciousness that need to needed to be raised. Uh-huh. 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 So a, a, a social consciousness that needed to be raised. Right. Right. And everything went from everything proceeded from there. And so, say a little bit more about the resistance that you experienced when you started to assert that this um, that violence against women and children was actually more common. Oh, oh, you know, the the it was very tiresome. Um, <laughs> it, it, um. It's funny because um, the worst of the resistance was really in the backlash period when, when, um, when so many people started um, coming forward and being in support groups and and 
um, and confronting their parents. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so the 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 backlash, the worst organized backlash was this false memory society, right. false memory found false memory syndrome foundation. They, um, I mean, talk about disinformation. They created this whole non-existent syndrome, false memory syndrome, mm -hmm. and claimed that anybody who remembered. Um, who, who, who had delayed recall, who had had amnesia, mm -hmm. followed, you know, followed by delayed recall, which happens in maybe, I don't know, 10 to 20 percent of cases. Mm -hmm. um, no, I mean, it, it's not that common, but it does happen, and it's very well documented throughout the trauma field, um, not just with sexual abuse, but... Mm -hmm. um, but this, uh, if, so if anybody had amnesia plus delayed recall, then they must have been put up to it by a therapist. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there was a there was a court case in which a father took his daughter's therapist to court mm -hmm. for um, basically uh, for sort of hypnotizing his daughter and making her think that she was an incest survivor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the daughter got on the stand and said, no, these are my memories. The therapist mm -hmm. didn't implant these memories in me. Mm -hmm. um, and I had them before I even went to the therapist. Mm -hmm. But it didn't matter. The jury listened to him. Mm -hmm. And I thought, mm -hmm. my God, here we are again. We're, you know, <laughs> we're, um, Someone is saying, "Don't listen to that woman." Someone, if she, she's, she's crazy. She's out of her mind. Somebody put ideas in her head, uh -huh. and that actually seemed more plausible to people uh -huh. right. than in a court of law, right. than the idea that this woman was telling the truth. Uh -huh. uh, right. So that was the nadir, I think, of the backlash. And a lot of therapists got sued, and a lot of therapists got threatened. Uh -huh. um, no, you know, these are not nice people. Uh -huh. um, but ultimately, it, it passed. And, you know, I think there were some over, overly eager therapists who somehow got, up, got ahead of their patients and assumed that if they had X, Y, and Z symptoms, they must have been abused as children, which you, uh -huh. you can't do. That's not uh -huh. how you not not how therapy works. But therapy. Um, once that all got clarified, um, and you know the body of of evidence just kept increasing, uh -huh. and pretty soon we had, you know, instead of just testimony of patients um, and. Uh, studies by psychiatrists. We had epidemiology studies with good uh -huh. random samples, and you know, coming out with very high uh, frequencies uh, or prevalence of of child abuse, physical, right. sexual, emotional, witnessing domestic violence, and the whole range of adverse childhood experiences that uh -huh. we uh, that now are sort of fundamental in medical, you know, fundamental part of medical knowledge. Uh -huh. So, uh, in, you know, it, in, in the 40 years since I was a resident, there's been a lot of change. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. uh, considering the longest that, that, you know, for women, it's the longest revolution, uh -huh. I don't know, that, that seems okay to me. That seems yeah. like, you know, let's uh, not, I mean, not that we don't have miles to go, but at least but where in, do you think in we some are parts now? of the world. Hmm? Where, do you, where do you think we are now, at least in the U.S.? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I thought, I think something you were talking, you talked about in the book, uh, talked about the cycles of, the historical cycles and so forth, and 
you know, once again, going from the Freud's experience to the this backlash and, and uh, our lifetime around this. Uh, but where do you think we are now and where are we going in terms of recognizing and addressing um, trauma and trauma victims and survivors? Well, you know, it's very... Um, uh, the, the success is patchy, you know. It's not... Um, I mean, you could... I, I could give you some examples of progress, and you could give me a dozen counterexamples. Yeah, yeah. Say we have made no progress at all. Yeah. You know, and, and that we're right back where we started. Right. And both would be true. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, but but I I also take a lot of. Um, Comfort, not comfort's the wrong word, um, inspiration more um, from the fact that this is a worldwide movement now. Uh-huh. You know, um, I mean, even the fact that, that <laughs> I mean, that there is a convention against all uh, forms of discrimination against women. Of course, the United States hasn't signed it. Right. I think we're, we and I, I think we and um, this one other country, I think Saudi Arabia maybe or one of those mm-hmm. that hasn't signed it. Right. Um, but um, but it's um, you know international and mm-hmm. there is actually a special rapporteur in the UN on violence against women. Uh-huh. And she goes around from country to country and says what kind of progress, if anything, if any, they've made about doing anything about violence against women. And it's mm-hmm. understood as a human rights violation. Right. Which is not as change. something right. that men do because, you know, they they need to have sex or because they're angry or, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. It's, yeah. it's, it's not a, a it's. Uh, it's it's understood as a form of oppression, uh-huh. and uh-huh. I think and you know to have that level of analysis be now uh, part of a worldwide conversation, uh-huh. I think is remarkable. Uh-huh. Truly, really. yeah. So um, Sally, um, I wanted. To- uh, to ask you about uh, the impact of this book on your work um, in relation in dialogue with Judith. Well, um, hi, um, Judith. It's really hi, great. To, hi. It's, it's really amazing to be on a uh, in a conversation with you um, because your book has had a tremendous, you know, as with so many people, um, it's had a tremendous effect on. The work that I've done over the years, and many of my colleagues, and and uh, the organization I work for now, um, and the organization I work for now does a lot of. Um, it's a grassroots organization in New York City, and we do a lot uh-huh. of um, work. Um, as I was rereading your book again, probably for the many many times I've read it, um, I just the impact. Well, several things. One, probably standing out the most for us right now, is the understanding that community can both harm and heal. Yeah. And how yes. criti- critical it is to have survivors um, find community. Um, and we do a lot of group work on a on a grassroots mm-hmm. level. We we do uh, we teach um, community members. Um, uh, we, we talk about women's empowerment groups, um, talk about your three stages of healing, mm-hmm. and um, but just the idea that communities, and, and we have a particularly large part of our work is with faith communities, um, mm-hmm. that those communities need to create the conditions um, for justice and, um, and belonging and transparency and um, those belonging in a in a, a a way that they're looking at power and in a different way so that's been 
tremendous for us. Um, oh, and I think it's you know. so important because um, it, it seems to me um, that that that's what survivors need most. They don't necessarily need yes. to heal a relationship with the abuser or even mm -hmm. with the the non-abusive bystander, but with mm -hmm. some larger community where yes. there's really a sense of, of belonging and mm -hmm. of where where really the shame that the the mm -hmm. profound shame that goes along with this kind of trauma yes. um, can be healed. Um, and that may or may not be in the community that where the trauma mm -hmm. took place. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Well, let's um, let's go to the first slide, and um, because I think uh, we we've got a quotation here from early in your book that begin again begins to lay out your approach to this, uh, particularly around the moral and ethical uh, dimension. It is morally impossible to remain neutral. The bystander is forced to take sides. It's very tempting to take the side of the perpetrator. All the perpetrator asks is that the bystander do nothing. He appeals to the universal desire to see, hear, and speak no evil. The victim, on the contrary, asks the bystander to share the burden of pain. The victim demands action, engagement, and remembering. Now, what, what I have always found quite profound about this um, particular portion is that you say from the very beginning there are, are three 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 people in the room at least. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. And uh, you, you, you name the bystander as one of the players and for for those of us in the Christian community um, we actually uh, have a significant story about that in Luke's Gospel of the Good Samaritan and the, uh, the, the temptation of the bystander literally to pass by on the other side and not right, stop right. and engage. Uh, and yet the, the teaching is that uh, one person does stop and that ends up being the person who's most marginalized in the community and, and mm -hmm. yet stops right. and takes care of the victim. So mm -hmm. within our context, our faith context, you know, with, We've already been taught about this, and yet it astonishes me how difficult it is for people to really get what that means. And mm -hmm. this notion mm -hmm. of taking sides that, that you just put out there in the first chapter of your book. Um, I, I remember so well a call from a woman who'd been hospitalized by her husband. And uh, as soon as she got out of the hospital, she went to her church and went to her pastor and, and told them what had happened and, and what he had done to her and asked for their help and asked for their support. And the response of the pastor was to say, well, uh, we're really sorry this has happened to you, but, you know, we can't take sides. Right. And mm -hmm. she, Amen. And she's, yeah. she's telling me this story, and, and I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, just going nuts because it's mm -hmm. so profoundly contrary to at least what I think we're supposed to be doing as, as people of faith. Mm -hmm. um, but but oh, I've and, heard it consistently and, and so you put it right out there. Well, you know, it was maddening because the family therapy people were doing the same thing. Oh, we can't take sides. Where you know, if there was violence, well, maybe she did something to provoke the violence. This was a family systems problem, and, right. and you know, we can't call him the perpetrator and her the victim because, you know, it's a it's a family dynamics problem, and it drove me wild. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I tried to make a distinction between therapeutic neutrality, which means not taking sides in the patient's conflict. So that mm -hmm. you don't say to a battered woman, you must leave your husband. Mm -hmm. um, you say, I know it's a it's a real it's a, it's a real conflict. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, this; on the other hand, that. And, but that that's different from moral neutrality. Mm -hmm. And morally, you can't be neutral when one person's beating up another person. I, I know. <laughs> yeah. But how do we how do we continue to move on that? I mean, uh, literally, I just find that one of the biggest challenges in faith groups it, it, 
Yeah. So how, how have you how have you addressed that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would say it is our biggest challenge, and we, I often read this in faith group, this very quote, and um, I I think uh, the by in the in this case the bystander is singular, and in the story of the Samaritan, but I think often bystanders pay a price in the faith community for sticking with. The victim, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's why you have to build the collective, and you have to yes. to, to create a you have to shift the theological and norms and practices. Really, it's a very mm -hmm. deep work, um, but to get people to um, so the bystanders feel safe themselves coming and that's standing right. with the, right. with the person. So it is about <laughs> shifting the collective, and that is challenging. It is, it, yes. is, it is challenging and deep cultural change. Mm -hmm. And I, I find in, um, that they're usually how it works in, with our partnerships, faith partnerships, are there a few people in a faith community that step forward and make mm -hmm. a connection and get support, often a, sort of on the down low for a while, so that they mm -hmm. can figure out mm -hmm. how to approach it. Um, we don't have as much luck going directly to faith leaders all the time. Probably mm -hmm. our, our strength has been uh, partnering with people who really want to bring that. And they come at, you know, and they do it in different ways. And we respect mm -hmm. each one of those ways, just as you would a, an individual who has different, you know, not a cookie cutter kind of approach. But it is absolutely the heart of the matter, the victim blaming and shaming, and then the way in our context, the faith context, how uh, that is grounded in some pretty ugly theology. You know, mm -hmm. so. mm, little patriarchal worship yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. And, and some of it's e even in the more um, uh, so-called um, progressive uh, churches, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you find that the idea of justice doesn't really um, include violence against women or violence women. against children. Yeah. It's not it, because know, justice itself is even kind of a male. Yeah, well, the, 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 there's a wonderful um, anthropological study by Peggy Reeves Sande. She looked mm. at um, high rape and low rape cultures. Yeah. A big cross-cultural study of the, I guess, a hundred some different cultures that in the uh, Harvard archive, and mm -hmm. she found that high rape culture, uh, high rape cultures were those who had a male deity rather mm -hmm. than a female or couple mm -hmm. as uh, objects of worship, mm -hmm. um, where that were highly militarized. Um, and where there was um, uh, highly segregated um, work uh, mm -hmm. with child care being uh, relegated, being devalued and relegated to women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the other thing in that uh, study, Judith, that uh, I think is significant is that the religious leadership in the low rate cultures was also shared by men and women. And in yes. the high rate cultures yeah. it was exclusively a male domain of, of uh, spiritual right, leadership. Right. Which right, I right, you right. know is yeah. very significant for us. Um, and part I hope part of the change that we're we're about um, at, at least in terms of uh, bringing more women into visible leadership in uh yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. So we have a question um, from one of our participants. What is your hope for the future? Um, and what is the essential next step to help trauma survivors heal from a collective or macro scale? Any wow. thoughts on that? <laughs> I don't know. I, um, um, you know, I think healing is a long road. I wish I had a sort of a quick fix 
uh, idea of how to uh-huh. do it. I don't. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I think community is key, as Sally said. Um, sometimes we 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 run a lot. We like to run a lot of groups. We, uh, you know, groups for survivors uh-huh. um, are wonderful. Um, and and sometimes they what those become is a bridge to a new community, because uh-huh. you know bringing people out of isolation into some small protected space where. Um, you know the the expectation is always of being uh, uh, shamed and uh, basically expelled from the community, uh-huh. being uh-huh. treated as as uh, either because your your story is too terrible or not terrible enough or whatever the reason is that you have this secret on top of the incest that you. You know that means that you're a defiled and and untouchable being, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the relief that people experience in groups is so it's wonderful. Um, so wonderful, so breathtaking mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that um, I think that you know the, the, just bringing people into groups out of isolation and whatever outreach or organizing it takes to do that. Uh Um, And then, you know, a lot of times when people reach a certain point of, in their healing, they develop what Robert Lifton called a survivor mission, meaning, Mm. you know, taking, taking one's, one's trauma and making it a gift to others, Uh basically saying, if I can prevent one child from going through what I went through, Uh or Uh if I can help one survivor um, in her recovery, Uh then it won't all have been, it won't all have been in vain. Uh No, it, it kind of morally transforms the experience. And I, you know, we don't, prescribe this as something for everybody, but I do think that for many survivors, taking it that additional step when, you know, and not feeling that as an obligation, but uh-huh, uh-huh. when it when that feels like something, yes, yeah. when it feels like something that would feel inspiring and, uh-huh. and um, then um, you know, I, I think that that can be a next step. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I I have to say though, and then maybe I'll share this as as a sort of farewell. Mm-hmm. I, I also think of of one of the survivors, a rape survivor that I or that I interviewed for my book, and she's somebody who had been horribly raped and had um, by a stranger, and. Um, walking alone at night and had terrible PTSD and um, but managed to get herself some good therapy and uh, started to recover and did have a survivor mission where she uh, got involved at Boston Area Rape Crisis Center and Mm -hmm. did a lot of public education Mm -hmm. uh, particularly on college campuses which as you know is kind of a laboratory for rape, especially mm-hmm. in the first freshman year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, kids away from home for the first time and don't have their own support group developed right. yet and right. trying trying out new things that they weren't allowed to do at home. And anyway, um, I could go on and on about that and bystander right. intervention and so on. But at a, at, so she did that for a while and then Um, she went on, she was a very talented woman, and she decided she wanted to write a novel, and um, and she decided that uh, even though she felt very guilty, she wasn't going to write about rape in her novel, Mm -hmm. because she had other things that she wanted to talk about, Mm -hmm. and it wasn't, the rape wasn't, she she was a rape survivor, but that wasn't the only thing she was. 
so right. um, and well she she did continue to do education on campuses, and somebody um, asked her something a question like well what's the what's the worst thing about um, being a rape survivor now for you and she said, "Oh, it's so boring." Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 well, that's I'm so tired of talking about it. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I yeah like it was a yeah. wonderful thing. So yes, yeah. because sometimes so, people people do get stuck in that a little bit. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, she, get, get to that she, place. Yeah. So it was a, so maybe that's a good story to for me to sign off with that you know there's okay. there. People do discover that there is more to their life, and yeah, yeah. that's a wonderful thing, too. Right. Yes. Right. Well, Judith, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate yeah. it, and I think from oh, all of us. absolutely my pleasure. Thank, thank you, you for so writing much. this book and for, for providing this foundation for our work for so many years, and uh, we're very well, grateful. Well, I'm so, so glad you are out there doing what you're doing, and you know, it's an inspiration to me. So thank you and and good evening to everyone who's listening. So Judith, this is Sarah. I have a whole bunch of uh, fan letters that I'll be forwarding on to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Written in and said how this book has just you. been central to their lives. So you will get a bunch of letters from me. Okay, <laughs> great. Fun. Thanks. Thanks very have a much. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. So uh, that was a, a real opportunity for all of us to have a moment with Judith Herman um, at this stage in her life and career, and uh, so we, we value it very much. I realized as we got going that uh, I forgot, Sally, at the start to uh, check in with our, our listeners and see who's here tonight, and so can we still do that, Sarah? There's the poll. Oh. So okay. if everybody would just mark who you are and mark, does it have to be one, Sarah, or can they mark more than one? Uh, I think it's just one, though okay. I know there's going to be a lot of overlap, so. Pick one. Pick one. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now um, and post the, okay, so there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Oh, nice. Okay, good mix, yep, yep. Yeah. And I, I'm sure the there's an overlap with activists and all of those other categories, so yeah. mm -hmm. it's it's hard to choose one category for most of us, it so is. that's that's fine. <laughs> but uh, let's go ahead. What what uh, Sally and I had talked about doing was just looking at some of the texts from um, Judith's book in terms of raising the issues that she's been helpful uh, with and talking about those. And we will get to some of your questions and comments here as we go. Uh, but one of the things that she definitely uh, was uh, asserting is the importance of the systemic change necessary to change the cultural norms around uh, particularly gender-based violence and what it takes to do that. So um, in, in this uh, page nine, and part of what amazes me is how much of our first chapter kind of lays out the, the whole thing and, and then of course she goes into much more detail uh, to follow but uh, the first chapter still continues to, to be for me so foundational. Mm -hmm. The whole traumatic reality and consciousness requires a social context that affirms and protects the victim and that joins the victim and witness in a common alliance. For the individual victim this social context is created by relationships with friends, lovers, and family. For the larger society, the social context is created by political movements that give voice to the disempowered. In the absence of strong political movements for human rights, the active process of bearing witness inevitably gives way to the active process of forgetting. Um, 
I was thinking as she was talking there at the end, Sally, about uh, the uh, individual survivors who bring their experience out into the wider world and, and the fact that the bad women's movement and the anti-rape movement in this country are uh, perfect examples of uh, women who basically said we're not going to put up with this anymore and took their individual experiences and organized. Um, and we have those movements to thank for I think so much of what we have been able to do and certainly in terms of um, judicial reform and uh, legislative attention to the needs, particularly through the Violence Against Women Act and the Office on Violence Against Women. Mm -hmm. Those would not be here <laughs> were it not for the organizing that began in the 70s um, that, again, created the context where it became right. politically important to address this. Mm -hmm. um, but what about for you in terms of how you've seen that? About. Well, I, I, I kind of like to focus on the faith community for a minute because that's what yeah. came up for me reading this this time, and um, and how very often, and I, I don't think this is just in the faith community, but but um, I, I think there's a lot of turbulence in the the movement, and sometimes in my experience, I wonder if what it if I could even call it a movement sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm seeing um, a disconnection for a lot of survivors from political movement, the knowledge of how um, the domestic violence uh, remedies, the shelters that we have now, how those even came about. Um, so I think there, I see a lot of depoliticization um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how that manifests for uh, an individual survivor. Um, I've seen a lot of people who have done some amount of healing. I mean they're they're past the situation, um, the immediate say abusive relationship, they're past mm -hmm. that, that five, ten years. Um, and then they're in a faith community that doesn't allow this conversation at all. Mm -hmm. You know, that can totally silences it. And so I have the sense when I'm working in different faith communities um, that there are quite a few survivors who are kind of split and mm -hmm. not and not healed because there 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 isn't um, a theological political context that they can hold on to and until groups come together or Bible studies looking at things in a certain way and things coming from the pulpit or even prayers of the people so that it's acknowledged but that amnesia that Judith talks uh -huh. about um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. It just that or she she talks about the dialectic between wanting to tell tell everything and wanting to keep things secret and uh -huh. silent for safety uh -huh. and I, I just feel that all the time uh -huh. and, and with with different um, either in, in the secular world with social service agencies or in the faith communities that I go to and um, so we try to really make that history live mm -hmm. for uh -huh. in our uh -huh. in our education and and also make the connections to other kind forms of um, you know Judith started by talking about different liberation movements, you know, but looking at the different, the way the connections between racism and sexism and violence um, are flowing together, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and um, and as people like to say, intersecting, you know. Um, so I think that's a really important part of healing mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. to make the to have it uh, collect, you know, the personal meaning and the social meaning that she talks about in groups where you're able to make those connections. So, and, um, and for people who are members of faith communities, it's, I think, you describe very well that kind of split between, you know, I can't talk about this in my faith community. It, it's, it's kind of like, you know, being gay in the, in the old days, as it were. Yeah. And yeah. It's still, still in some places. Still, still in some places. Yeah, still in a lot of places. You, you can't talk about this part of my life 
in right. this part of my life. And right. uh, so being a survivor of, of um, violence, particularly in a personal violence, uh, private sphere, um, continues to be not necessarily talked about and like like you described we haven't created that context and mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes in in watching that play out in congregations it's I think two things go on one is um, we don't want to we still don't want to acknowledge that this this is us but we're, we're still we still think we can pretend that this is what happens to somebody else and um, and because that's what we want to be true is you know right. not in my family or not in my mm -hmm. faith group or whatever and and the other thing um, which I, I think is part of the Good Samaritan story is we don't want to get involved because we don't know what that's going to require from us right. Right. us collectively or individually for clergy I think there's a real resistance to um, and, and a a legitimate one in the sense of a lot of clergy don't feel qualified and they're not <laughs> they're not qualified right. to to be the singular singular part of responding what they don't understand is that's not what's expected of them but to be part of a collective response and to, to help people find the help they need to, to create that community where it is okay for that person to, to come forward and say, this happened to me, how, are you, how can you respond and come around me and stand in solidarity with me? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But we don't want to go yeah. there. Yeah, and, and some of that is um, fear and some of that is, you know, not wanting to say that my community has it. And just, it goes back again to that shame and blame and mm -hmm. that almost goes on to the community if there's someone inside of here that's created that you know had that happen to them in their life that's something wrong with us you know mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. that that's why a clearer understanding of, of the dynamics of interpersonal violence and intimate partner violence is so critical in mm -hmm. working with faith communities because yeah. No faith community is going to say they want domestic violence in their midst. Right. I mean, they, but sometimes, in my experience, um, there's say the pastor said, "Okay, that, great. You know, we don't we're against that. You know, of course, talk to this group." <laughs> but when they realize the deeper implications for the community and how much work that is, and maybe how much of a challenge to their own power that is, and mm -hmm. Um, what that means in terms of even um, more liberated biblical interpretation for people having a, a then then things get shut down. But but people don't unless you go deep enough, you can't mm -hmm. really make a change. Um, right, because so. it's it's way more than the one Sunday a year yeah. during domestic violence right. awareness month. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a comprehensive response where you almost have to do a kind of, I mean, ideally, this is so hard right. to do, but you know, like sort of a, an, a, an audit of every part of your faith life and what right. the words mean and what the prayers mean and what how you stand and sit and how you meet them. You know, very mm -hmm. comprehensive um, because it's culture change. Right. I mean that's right. Right. It, it, it's theo it's theological culture change and um, right. we know that takes a long time. That's right. That's right. Well, let's go to the next uh, text here and see. Uh, oh yeah, um, yeah. This is this is sort of your favorite, Sally. I think. Why don't you read that one? Okay. The traumatic event challenges an ordinary person to become a theologian a philosopher and a jurist. The survivor is called upon to articulate the values and beliefs that she once held and that the trauma destroyed. She stands mute before the emptiness of evil, feeling the insufficiency of any known system of explanation. Survivors of atrocity of every age and every culture come to a point in their testimony where all questions are reduced to one spoken more in bewilderment than in outrage. Why? 
The answer is beyond human understanding. Beyond this unfathomable question, the survivor confronts another equally incomprehensible question, why me? And there's a, actually another part of that, um, a little, a few paragraphs down to that. Can I just read that those, those words a little bit? Um, so there is a rupture in her sense of belonging with a shared system of belief. Thus, she faces a double task. Not only must she rebuild her own shattered assumptions about meaning, order, and justice in the world, but she must also find a way to resolve her difference with those whose beliefs she can no longer share. That, that's very heart-rending to me because I've met so many survivors of faith who have had to, I mean, sometimes they're exiled because no one believes them, but other times they even join a church after their, um, or a faith community after the, their relationship is over, and they still, you know, as I was saying before, they still don't, they still can't reconcile their beliefs and what's happened to them with what they're seeing in front of them. And so there's a lot of spiritual power that's outside of community um, because of that. And it's just, it's, it, and it's also a tremendous task that we have to recognize that survivors have to work through this and lose, lose much more than a relationship. You know, they sometimes, you know, losing community, um, losing cherished ID, ideas or ideals. That's a, it's a lot of loss. It's a lot of loss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think too that that you know what she's pointing to here is the is the classic um, theodicy issue of why is there suffering? Right. And I really appreciate that she says the answer is beyond human understanding because that's what I. Yes. Think. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I, I totally appreciate that too. It's incomprehensible. No, it right. it, it is. It is. It's, and yet, uh, yeah, it's and, mystery. Right, and and yet classic theologians have you know gone all the way around the barn to explain it to us why they're suffering, um, and and none of those explanations have ever been adequate for me. So so I I'm going with Judith on this one. It is me too. Human <laughs> understanding. Um, it is. But. But nonetheless, it, it, we know how what a critical question it is, and um, I think that either the the, um, the response of a faith community that tries to answer it in a way that is really uh, healing the wound lightly uh, is probably worse than just acknowledging we don't know. Uh, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, especially when it comes to suffering, you know, using um, suffering as mm -hmm. a reason that suffering is can bring you to a deeper place, a closer mm -hmm. place um, with God. Um, that you know that that's very dangerous um, mm -hmm. glorification of suffering, as you you know, as you've written about it. And um, yeah. but that's a very that is a way that everybody tries to make sense of that mystery. You know? Right, um, right. But, but I think that's exactly what's going on both for the survivor and for the bystanders is yes. how do we make sense and make meaning, which I think yes. is the theological task here, how do we make meaning yes. in the midst of these experiences of evil, experiences of suffering that, that are beyond comprehension. Um, yeah. and and how, you know where? How do we lead our people in that? How do we how do we lead that discussion? Lead that uh, bring some teaching, bring some insight to a deeper discussion, as you were saying, um, that is theologically has theological integrity, but mm -hmm. becomes then a point of resource for um, for all of us, basically, in in facing future um, yeah. realities. So I just think that's our job, basically. <laughs> yeah, that, and yeah, it's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, I wish more of us were engaged in that particular job. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let's let's go on to uh, the next slide. <clears throat> See how far we get here. So we're back to the discussion community. Which uh, we yeah. Wanna, we, 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 yeah. We've talked about that a lot. Um, this is 
Do you want to read it? Do you want to no, read you go it? ahead. You read this. Okay. Okay, the response of the community has a powerful influence on the ultimate resolution of the trauma. Restoration of the breach between the traumatized person and the community depends first upon a public acknowledgement of the traumatic event and second upon some form of community action. Once it is publicly recognized that a person has been harmed, the community must take action to assign responsibility for the harm and to repair the injury. These two responses, recognition and restitution, are necessary to build the survivor's sense of order and justice. Um, Marie, have you ever, have you, do you have an example of a, a faith community re response that fits into recognition and restitution that you could share? Um, I actually have seen it on occasion, not, not frequently, but I have seen it on occasion when um, a community has been able to respond. Uh, there was one situation with a, a young man who had been sexually abused as a teenager by his youth pastor. <clears throat> and he, he finally started to talk about that and, and to seek help with that, and then he got to the place where he wanted the pastor to be confronted. And so he reported it, and, and I worked with the, with the uh, judicatory on that case. And uh, one of the things that the congregation, once they were told that this had happened and, and the pastor had been... Um, uh, the complaint had been brought against him, then uh, they wouldn't have a meeting. And so for people to talk about it and, and to, for me to do some education and so forth, the young man who was the survivor, we, we told him this was going to happen, and we said, you know, um, please come if you want to, but you don't have to, but we want you to know this is going on, and, and there, we want to talk with the congregation. He hadn't been identified at that point at all. So he said, okay, let me think about it. And he kind of came down to the point of uh, maybe I will, maybe I won't. And he said, but if I come, uh, I'd like to speak. And I said, that's fine. Uh, you know, we'll make a space for that. And you decide in, in the moment whether you want to do that or not. And, and then you'll have a chance to do that. So uh, he did. He, he decided. I did some introduction and some basic education about you know, what it is, um, and then he gave me a signal, and he said he wanted to come forward. He came forward and, and briefly told about his experience. The reason it was so powerful was that he'd grown up in that church, you know, two generations of his family, and <gasps> so oh. people knew him and, and knew him as part of their church family, part of their life together. And so his capacity to stand up and say to his congregation, this is what has happened to me, and I'm the one who brought the complaint, was the thing that turned the congregation. Because, um, and he's standing right there in front of them, and they wow. could not turn away from him. And so wow. they, came, they did come forward, I mean, literally and, and figuratively. Um, and, you know, they stood behind him as the process went through of calling uh, his perpetrator to account, but wow. but that was that was kind of an accident. I mean, in yeah. terms of of you know, I certainly didn't know what was going to happen, yeah. uh, but it was important for him because it meant that he was starting to take control over his story and where he wanted to share it and so forth. It was important to the congregation that they have that encounter with him. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's told me that we can do this. You know, we, we are capable yeah. of this. And uh, and then and so how do we prepare for uh, and open the door so that people like him would would be able and ready at a particular time to come forward and and do that. But I think that's part of what Judith was talking about. That in and sharing his story with that community was a gift to that community. Yeah. Because it gave them the opportunity to then be the church, to, to be who right. they have been taught to be in response yeah. to him and his family. Yeah, but yeah I, I really do think it's, it's doable. And uh, that's, 
that's the other thing I think in terms of our teaching efforts is is to try to get people a sense. You know, we can do this. This is not rocket science. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But it does take it does take courage. It takes uh, resistance. It takes uh, you know being willing to stand up and take leadership around these issues to begin to open those doors for people. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. But. <clears throat> It can happen. <laughs> yes. yes. And, and, and it, I mean, I think probably one of the um, biggest obstacles, very si very simply, is um, uh, the judgment, the punitive and judgmental nature of um, communities. Um, sometimes I uh, ask people. You know, we do resources and roadblocks in your community. What What are the biggest roadblocks? And it, and often, more often than not, probably 89% of the time, it's gossip, it's judgment, it's mm -hmm. the fear of what people are going to say. So if you have fear mm -hmm. underlying, even though sometimes on the surface everyone's really nice and mm -hmm. um, you you. You could never stand up and do that. You would. Uh -huh. So it it uh -huh. takes a lot of it takes a the beloved community is what uh -huh. it, you know takes. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. um, and that's yeah. a long road. Yeah, but I, the thing that continues to baffle me, I have to say, over the years, is that this whole um, dynamic of shame and blame of victims, and and how rarely. There is shame on the part of the perpetrator, and how rarely there, that dynamic is turned to the person who really caused this to begin with. Um, yeah. And and again, not not in a punitive way, but a, a recognition that this person in our midst is responsible for harm that's been done to someone else. Now, what are we going to do about that? But it starts with being able to look at that person and say. You caused harm here, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and um, you know there's a, certainly a discussion about the the nature of shaming and so forth and so on. But but for me, in terms of uh, a moral context in which it's possible to say to someone, "You are responsible. You are the man," as Nathan said to David. Um, yeah, that capacity. To, to call somebody out basically and and then deal with the concept deal with what that means and deal with you know the brokenness and so forth but I, I just don't see that capacity very often at all in our faith communities and, and I no, think that's I part mean, of the problem yeah I mean often I see um, protecting right. the person who's caused the harm um, right. worried about what could happen to them worried that their reputation, their job, I mean very worried about that. Not not really necessarily worried about what's really going on with them that right. creates the harm, but but maintaining um, depending on who that person is in the community. But sure. if it's a if it's a deacon or a vestry person, um there's going to be a pretty knee-jerk response to protect that, and of mm -hmm. course, it is all based on power. Um, yeah. But yeah. even some, but you know, even when the person is outside the church and the person being abused is inside the church, um, then the person inside the church often, in, in my experience, gets blamed for being with somebody outside the church. So you, <laughs> so you, so you really brought that on yourself. I mean, we had a murder in New York City. Um, of a young woman who was living with a man in sin, mm -hmm. and um, in sin, and she, um, when she just she be she became a Christian, and she decided to move out from him. And when she did that, um, and not because she became a Christian, but he was abusive, so she went she left, mm -hmm. and he killed her. And um, a pastor from a pretty it's a pretty big pulpit. Um, Condemned, said, "This is what happens when you live in sin." I mean, oh, it was God. just so painful. Oh, <laughs> it was really painful. It was yeah. very painful, and many people reacted to it, including yeah. even the district attorney's office. Um, asked, yeah. 
you know, for me yeah. to call, but they, they yeah. couldn't respond to it. So there's still a lot of places like yeah. that. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. And think about all the people sitting in that congregation who oh. heard that, and, and all the survivors, and all the parents of survivors, and everybody sitting yeah. there and hearing yeah. the, that pastor say that from that pulpit. Yeah. Um, so our time is, is running. Um, Sarah, will you uh, organize the questions? Because I can only see one at a time. And so I, I, if you could um, lead us through at least a several questions, you might be able to combine some. Let's see here. Um, OK, so here's one. How do we effectively answer those male-dominated powers today, such as legislative bodies and religious institutions, who blame the victims by claiming survivors are the aggressors for advocating to access accountability and justice from institutions and for trying to create protective reductive reduction factors? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Be nice to know that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, part of it, I think, is is beginning to, to or one of the things I watch is for the institutional responses. Um, so like with campus sexual assault and uh, military sexual assault. So, you know, those are two very current, uh, serious, serious problems, which um, in which institutions have played a role and generally not been that helpful and but have the capacity to really uh, be helpful and do their job um, and and I think we're seeing you know a little bit of, of push there a little bit of progress uh, we're seeing some progress I think in faith communities it's slow but uh, it's coming in terms of uh, abuse by faith leaders and addressing that uh, effectively by the structures of, of faith communities um, at, at least I think we're at a point where uh, we're not going back. I think that's that's part of what I was hearing Judith say. We're not going back from a recognition and acknowledgement in society that these things are happening and uh, shouldn't be happening. Um, I, I live in Tennessee now, and so I kind of keep an eye on the state legislature, which is very interesting. And they just... Um, kicked out a legislator who's been sexually harassing women in the state capitol for a number of years and he's a Republican and the legislature is Republican but it was an amazing bipartisan effort finally and both men and women in the legislature finally came together and said okay this is enough this is so beyond the pale and um, so threw him out of the legislature basically um, and, and I take that as one little moment of, <laughs> yes, that's right, that's, you know, and, and the coming together to do that appropriately, uh, I think, is, is very important. The, the slide that we have here reminds us, and this is from uh, Judah's book, that the experience of institutional betrayal has increasingly become the focus of awareness among survivors of many different forms of trauma. The common theme is the profound breach of trust that occurs when those in positions of authority by their acts of omission and commission effectively take the side of the perpetrators in their midst. And that's what you were describing, um, Sally. And, and my experience in working on uh, abuse by clergy in this regard is that people who are harmed by an individual clergy person as they deal with that and face that and, and decide what they want to do about it, um, I find them very much able to deal with the fact that this individual uh, abused me, but what they can't deal with is when the institution, the church, does not respond appropriately and, and really take right. their side and stand by them. Um, so in that particular instance, and I think the same thing would be, we could say about the military and the university and so forth, whatever that institutional setting is in which this happens, if, you know, it's going to happen, okay? That's, it's a fact of life, unfortunately. But when it happens, where does the institution, where is the power, where are the powers that be to basically say, no, this is not acceptable, 
and we will not have this here and we will respond and stand by the side of the person who's been harmed. That's when people are able to move through this. And that and that goes back to the community and that the role of community that it doesn't break the bonds of community. It breaks the bonds of that particular one-on-one uh, -on -one situation or the setting that that occurred in, but it doesn't destroy people's sense of community and the way the world should be, which is right. what you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Well, that just it's it's a refusal. I mean, it it's like not scapegoating, but it's just a refusal to see the systemic nature of the problem mm -hmm. too. Right. and what it's rooted in, you know, right. just, it's like, it's always fine, it's that, it's that, you know, just in the way that we um, act as though people who are abusive are monsters and they're abnormal, but in fact, it's so ordinary and so much a part of our society to treat others in a less than way, you know, that we, we often don't see that it's rooted in that larger systemic violence. and. Um, that comes in all different structures in different ways. Right. So, right, right. It's always it's always better to individualize, and then everybody's let off the hook. You know. So. Right. It's, that's why we can forget. If we, if we keep it on that individual basis, then we can forget and move on. Right. We we and, the bystanders can forget. Right. In the, in and case. it's very it's very dangerous too because it shuts people who need help down from seeking help. I mean, I'm thinking about, I've, I've spent quite a few years working with um, the child welfare system, and which is another institution that has had a very difficult time with domestic violence, recognizing right. domestic violence, understanding the co-occurrence with child abuse, and, and um, because of the fear of what could happen, you know, with having your children removed, for right. example, right. silence, because the institution is not going to protect you. You are not right. going to find justice in the courts. You are not going to... So the epidemic proportions, um, you know, all these figures that we have that are reported, which are just horrendous, yeah. that's such a small amount, because there's yeah. so many people who are so afraid of, the, of institutional violence that mm -hmm. they'll never step forward, mm -hmm. and that's... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A very difficult uh, reality. Yeah, and, and what you're describing there is not not just the institute. That's it's the it's the commission part of what Judith is saying. It's not just the omission of not doing anything about right, it. Right, it's the commission being part of the problem. Right. Yeah. For a child. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sarah, other question you want to highlight? Well, uh, I just want to. There were a couple of comments that I think are uh, good to share. Um, Sarah says that when she stumbled upon the fact that there was no memorial for rape survivors uh, in Judith's book, she launched a project to make one, and she has since raised $50,000 mm. and is working with wow. the Minneapolis Parks and Recreation Board to have it built as a permanent structure within the next year. Wow. Is that not awesome? That's, That's wonderful. Really yes. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> She also started um, a program called Break the Silence Day. It's an initiative to invite survivors of sexual violence to publicly identify themselves. Mm. And it's a Facebook page with Photo Project. Um, wow. And uh, so because I think we were talking a lot about community, people, uh, the questions are really about would, would things change if we ended the silence, if, we, if mm. all of the survivors we're out in the open. For example, someone mentioned the LGBT um, mm -hmm. uh, wedding, you know, marriage proposal. Well, because mm -hmm. suddenly everyone knew someone, they became invested in the in the uh -huh. Uh -huh. proposal. So right, yeah. right, yeah. It, it reminds me too of, of some of the things that uh, the young women are doing on campuses to be very visible um, and. And again, forming forming groups of survivors, which I think is really important, um, but then being very public in their um, uh, witness to one another and to the institution. And I think literally that's the that's the tipping point uh, when people are able to do that and come together. So 
I say right on. And one of the things we'll provide, Sarah, uh, when you get the end of this, we'll provide uh, other resources and other groups that are working on uh, that exact project, like the Voices and Faces project in Chicago and so forth. So I think there's a real, I think that's a point where we are right now, Sally, we were talking about um, how things are going. I think I, we're seeing much more of people's being able to come out and talk about this in a way that mm -hmm. contributes to that movement. Mm -hmm. um, anything else, Sarah, that you want to highlight for us at this point? Well, and part of that, uh, what, what she was saying is that it's much easier to come forward publicly when you create a space or event so that people can do it together rather than isolate right. it. Um, right. And I think that this, um, this slide about healing through community and how trauma isolates and how healing through community is, can be so powerful for that very reason. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, that makes me think of something else I wanted to um, bring up about trauma itself and something we're doing um, more and more which is just doing trauma education across the board and um, one of the there was something in, that I, I read again in Judith's book about I think some Norwegian warrior war uh, soldiers or something who were all given a, a, a one-page fact sheet about what PTSD was and how going back to them later they all held on to that and I feel like it's so important for people to understand the effects of trauma and everybody ha doesn't have to just be clinicians because mm -hmm. if we did that and understood that this is you know when someone has a fragment in memories they're not lying I mean that's something mm -hmm. that we come across a lot is people that mm -hmm. a, a worker a social worker will say well she's she, she said that one day and she she said this the other day and she's obviously not telling the truth and we know that that's one of the biggest responses that survivors right. get is like I don't believe that you know right. and we right. want to say well, I believe you and validation is critical so I we're doing uh, we have a trauma and healing 101 workshop that we're, we're doing and um, some other so I, I just think that could move us from a more punitive or be mm -hmm. part of that to move us from a punitive to a more compassionate response to know that we would all respond like this this is mm -hmm. how the the human psyche and the brain the neurobiology our neurobiology works I think it's really important to make trauma popular education around trauma so mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think that I think that would be another collective thing that could really help us and and shift to a, a different starting place uh -huh. um, uh -huh. and look look what's coming up on September 22nd uh, thank you Sarah for, for bringing that forward so our next webinar at Fake Trust oh. is uh, part of that discussion and and I think uh, the, the other way I like to approach that, Sally, is to really focus on n naming the bystander and then mm -hmm. focus on what does it mean to be a bystander and what, what, is, what is called for from us when we are bystanders. So, mm -hmm. because bystander is, is the common experience, you know, some among us are survivors, some among us are perpetrators, but all of us are bystanders at some point. Mm -hmm. And so when we're trying to educate, like you're talking about, the 101 for bystanders. So mm -hmm. I think then that begins to give people a place to even yeah. let this into their, to their thinking that, mm -hmm. oh, I really need to know something about this, even though I don't think anybody I know has ever been through this, which probably isn't true. Mm -hmm. But... Um, because that's that's what I struggle with is the way into folks. What's the what's the key to their investment in having this conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's very challenging in terms of um, mm -hmm. you know, like you say, getting deeper than uh, domestic violence funding or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, um, do you know about that? Oh, go go ahead, Sarah. 
No, I just uh, I just thought of the um, I wanted to mention the Brescia Meadows case. Are you uh, aware of that, Marie? Um, Brescia Meadows so. is she's a young girl. Um, she's 15 now, but when she was 14 year old, she shot her father. Um, she's a young black girl, and she shot her father, um, and what because he for 17 years he had been abusing her mother. Her mother tried to get orders of protection. The community was not there. Uh, just terrible. So anyway, she's in a juvenile detention home now, and she could get life, oh, or geez. we could say death in prison. It's in Ohio, and there's a faith response that's. Uh, percolating mm -hmm. but it just it's so unbelievable that we would treat a child and of course because she's a black child and a black girl and all those projections of her not having suffering or she's bad and that she's all she's already been in you know a lot of the language toward her is very terror stereotypical sexist mm -hmm. racist kind of language but the fact that no one can have compassion for the trauma that this child is going through, she's she tried she just acted out of terror. I mean, that's a, a case where if we could understand the trauma, how could we put a child mm -hmm. in prison? How would you know? Um, mm -hmm. But I I just want everyone to keep be aware of that case and mm -hmm. go to um, Brescia. I think it's uh, well. There's pray for Brescia. On October, okay. there's a vigil on October 5th that some people are calling for, and okay. uh, it, it it brings in all of these things we've been talking about. Okay. Right, right. Well, I, I don't know if she had a faith community herself yet. I would okay. try to find that out. Well, Sarah, let's let's at least get that link on um, our resources so that we can share that with people. But that that's the kind of response that we need to be making. That you know, that kind of witness mm -hmm. and, and public calling attention to that situation. Um, just in concluding, uh, this is our next discussion in December, uh, Faithfully Feminist. And so those of you who are with us, if you want to join us, um, be sure and sign up for that. And I'd like to conclude, let's go back to our last slide of the text, Sarah, if you can find that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, again, I, I found uh, Judah's first chapter and last chapter to be my favorites. Um, yeah. <laughs> because it kind of um, it, it encapsulates mm -hmm. what she's working on here. But this is at the very end of the book, and she's, she's talking about the possibilities for survivors in their healing process. Um, and, and again, coming out of her experience of, of working with people and, and seeing that process unfold, the survivor must be willing to relinquish the specialness of her identity. Only at this point can she contemplate her story as one among many and envision her particular tragedy within the embrace of the human condition. Commonality with other people carries with it all the meanings of the word common. It means belonging to a society, having a public role, being part of that which is universal. It means having a feeling of familiarity, of being known, of communion. And every time I read this, this part of it, um, I, I, I've written across it in big letters, uh, the church. This is what the church and our faith communities, whatever form they take, should be about, as far as I'm concerned, is creating that space in which a survivor of violence of any kind uh, can have that experience of commonality, of being a part of a larger uh, universal reality, and, uh, and with values Communion. that, in fact, stand beside that person in whatever it is they've been through. Um, and if we can do that as faith communities, I think then we're being faithful to yes. what God has called us to. So, yes, yes, <laughs> amen. All right. Amen. <laughs> well, thank you, Sally, so much. This has been a joy to, to be in this with yeah. you, and uh, I hope we can continue this conversation later. Yes, um, I do too. Good. And thank, uh, thank you. you.
to all of us who joined us tonight. Uh, again, please send your uh, comments and questions, and we'll do everything we can to respond. And I'll turn it back to Sarah for the final technical uh, thing. Okay, well, the Thank final you. technical thing is that uh, we're pretty much done here. You're going to be asked to fill out a survey when you exit the webinar tonight. So if you would just take a moment and give us your feedback, we would be very grateful to hear from you. Um, and this concludes our presentation. I hope that you can join us for the webinar tomorrow. It's at 11 a.m. Pacific time, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. And you can find more information on our website. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Thanks so much.